Food procurement can again play a key role because it is a multi-policy and multi-actor tool which by addressing a plurality of environmental, social and economic objectives can uh, at the same time can effectively contribute to a shift of the food system towards uh, more sustainable models. Hello and welcome to the Power of the Public Plate podcast, brought to you by ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, and the UN One Planet Network, with your host, myself, Josephine Hinz, based in ICLE's Berlin office, responsible for global initiatives of sustainable, innovative, and circular procurement. And I'm Peter De Franceschi, running ICLE's Brussels office and global food program. ICLE is a European and global network of local and regional governments committed to integrated sustainable development. And the UN One Planet Network works as a multi-stakeholder community across six programs, one of which is committed to the implementation of sustainable public procurement globally. In this podcast, we explore the stories of champions of food procurement around the world. In each episode, we bring you insightful and inspiring stories of how the public sector can influence the food value chain by leveraging its purchasing power. Join us as we talk to public sector staff, policy advisors and experts to learn how to support smallholder farmers, serve healthy and nutritious meals, source locally and climate friendly. In this episode, we travel to food-loving Italy to talk to Sabina Alberto Matteo from Fondazione Ecosistemi. Fondazione Ecosistemi is an Italian organization working on strategies, programs and actions for sustainable development in the country. And it's a national leader on GPP, on green public procurement practices. Sabina Nicolella mainly works on CSR, corporate social responsibility, stakeholder engagement and coordinates many European projects with Ecosistemi. She's an expert in sustainable budgets and Italian reporting on sustainability. Alberta Congeduti, on the other hand, is mainly working with GPP, sustainability reporting. She's an expert in assessing environmental and economic impacts of green procurement and is currently teaching at the Technical University in Dublin, in Ireland. And Matteo Gordini is the GPP expert and works on European projects around sustainable consumption and production. He's the contact person also of Procura Plus, the ICLE led European network of local and regional authorities for the promotion of innovative and sustainable procurement. Now, in this episode, Alberta, Sabina, and Matteo will walk us through the Italian food procurement system and legislation, which is particular for its mandatory green public procurement criteria that also include food and catering. We will talk about the involvement of small farmers, the importance of practices like life cycle assessments, and the general Italian approach to food procurement, which is also influenced by the country's delicious food culture. Without further ado, we bring you Sabina, Alberta, and Matteo from Fondazione Ecosistemi. Hello and welcome to this podcast. Uh, benvenuti Sabina, Nicolella, Alberta Congeduti and Matteo Gordini from Ecosistemi. It's a pleasure to talk to you about sustainable food procurement. We prepared a few questions for you and are looking forward to an interesting discussion. But uh, before entering into Media Res, could you briefly present your foundation and the work you do in relation to sustainable public procurement and in particular food procurement? Hello, Peter. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, so my name is Sabina Nicolella, and uh, as you said, I work with Fondazione Ecosistemi, which is an organization that has been engaged in the past 20 years in promoting uh, policies, tools, and strategies for sustainable development. And yes, green public procurement is one of the key uh, fields of action that we are engaged upon, and, uh, but obviously it's not the only one. Uh, so we, we are active in the field also of sustainable production and finance, uh, corporate social responsibility and stakeholder engagement, reporting, special, special planning and uh, local sustainable development, capacity building, training. Uh, and we all, we've been organizing uh, since um, 2008 uh, Forum Compra Verde, which is the largest event in Italy uh, and possibly in Europe, dedicated entirely to green procurement. 
so of course one of the core activities we do for uh, for food is in the food sector is uh, linked to public procurement public and private procurement within this initiative we've been promoting an award a prize uh, for for the best uh, sustainable canteens both in the public and private sector so we've been coordinating uh, scientifically uh, the the first uh, working group uh, in 2008 and then um, we we also took part with the relevant role in in the second working group for the upgrade of the um, of this criteria uh, and also we we promoted the inclusion of social criteria into the set of uh, sustainability criteria that public administrations have to use when procuring food. Um, also, we are um, the, the, the official um, trainer uh, for public administrations on green public procurement. We, we, we work on behalf of the Ministry of the Environment. Well, now it's called the, the Ministry of Ecological Transition. And um, what we do is we, we do trainings for public administrations, but also we uh, support them technically in writing uh, tenders and in, in all the procurement process. So um, we've been um, recently uh, supporting the administrations of Fano and Spoleto for uh, um, writing tenders for the catering services and actually the the Fano tender has been awarded as the best uh, tender for catering services by Food Insider. So we, we are quite quite proud of this this uh, achievement. Thank you very much. Italy has a very strong food culture beyond the pizza, pasta, gelato, which may help in sustainable, healthy food procurement. However. What challenge does the higher cost of such, and in Italy it's mandatory, sustainable food procurement play, and how do public procurers overcome it? When we talk about the cost of public procurement, uh, and also public procurement related to food, actually we, we usually to, are talking about the, the economic cost. So the, the first thought for everyone is, if you get better quality food, that mu must cost more. But actually, for public administrations, this is just one side of the of the problem, and of course, it's 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 a big part of, of the problem. But also, public administrations are facing costs related, for example, with the training of procurers that have now to apply new um, criteria in their procurement practices. They are not very familiar with the monitoring of environmental and social aspects and, uh, and that obviously bears um, quite a relevant transitional cost for, for public administrations. The same transitional cost is reflected on the market because uh, companies that um, are providing uh, products or services to, to public administrations in the food sector have to adapt to new to new legislation, which is not always easy to understand. Coming back to the um, to the economic cost of um, given by a higher quality at the moment, most um, public administrations are uh, reflecting this cost on the catering companies. So basically the, um, the services um, are procured through companies that then have to get in contact with, with suppliers. But because the cost of providing um, food in canteens obviously uh, is structured in such a way that the margin uh, for the the margin of profit for the company that is providing the catering service is not very high. If you compress, if you constantly compress the actual um, cost that the public administration is willing to pay, uh, and uh, the, for the catering companies it becomes very difficult to to stay in the market. And in fact, the 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 way they the few of them that survive, 
manage it because they they can use the the catering service as a sort of um, horse of Troy to to get in contact with the public administration and then provide other services. Obviously, this this is not a sustainable strategy in the long term. There are some guidelines from ANAC uh, that set the minimum price that should be paid, but these are just advisory guidelines. At, at the moment, um, not many public administrations are respecting them. On the other hand, you have some uh, some good examples like the one of Fano that I mentioned before that has included many social aspects and very high standards, um, also on the environmental side, uh, and that still is running and staying in place. Or, and they can do this by cutting waste, basically eliminating waste, having a better strategy to, uh, to bring a more, a more efficient service, and also by increasing positive externalities. So basically, when, when you're reasoning as a public administration, you cannot look just at the direct cost of what you're purchasing, but you have to look at also the the other costs, the hidden costs that you're avoiding. So if you're purchasing products that create local local wealth, that create local job opportunities, that um, reduce uh, health problems for pupils, but also the health problems linked, for example, to the production of food, uh, then you might be paying a higher cost for the for the catering services, but you are avoiding other costs on other skiers of your, of your action. So uh, you always have to, to balance and make evident also for the public administrations what the real benefits, also in economic terms, are when you when you procure sustainable food indeed i i think italy the country and the, the government has under, understood that because uh, it's also taking a step back italy is the only eu country indeed with a comprehensive mandatory green public procurement including minimum criteria for sustainable food procurement i think this is already quite uh, remarkable and what do the camps require from public authorities who tender for food and catering? And what criteria, without entering too much into detail, what criteria do you find particularly impactful along the food value chain, thinking about the different criteria that uh, the mandatory green public procurement in Italy regarding food and catering includes? Thank you, Peter. This is uh, Alberta Congeduti from uh, uh, Fondazione Ecosistem. The environmental criteria for food uh, are quite comprehensive. Uh, um, it's a new law which has been published uh, last year. And they include, first of all, uh, criteria on the origin and quality of food. So some uh, of the food has to be uh, 50% organic and the remaining, for example, vegetables or um, um, beef meat. And the remaining has to be anyway um, from uh, uh, integrated agriculture, integrated farming. And then there are other um, uh, percentages of organic food for other type of food. So the meats have different, uh, different uh, percentages um, and the same for milk. Uh, oil, etc. So all you know, there are different categories of food. With uh, um, all of them have to be partly per, uh, organic and part in the remaining from uh, integrated uh, agriculture or antibiotic free, etc. Depending what applies. Then uh, uh, there are other criteria which uh, are also very important uh, about food waste management and reduction. Then there is there are plastic free uh, criteria about in particular about dishes uh, and uh, containers and uh, cutlery. Uh, there is there are uh, criteria about uh, cleaning products which have to be eco label or equivalent. Uh, criteria about staff training and then low consumption appliances. There are many criteria. So these are all compulsory, and then there are some uh, uh, non compulsory uh, criteria. So it's it's quite comprehensive. There are many criteria, and uh, of course. Um, the criteria on the origin of and quality of food are very impactful. So they have an impact 
first of all, on the environment and on the health, and also uh, have social impacts if you consider social agriculture. Then, uh, uh, of course, the criteria on food waste have a huge impact uh, on different axes as well. And uh, obviously, the, the education uh, is also very impactful. It's hard to calculate the, the impact, but it's huge. <laughs> Thank you, Al Albert. In this case, I have some follow-up questions. You mentioned education, you mentioned uh, local food. I know that the National Italian Procurement Legislation awards short food supply chains, but we all, I also know that the EU procurement legislation, which is based on the single market uh, principle, right? That the EU is one single market and there shouldn't be any discrimination. So from a procurement legislation perspective, a procurer cannot simply ask for local and regional products. But at the same time, as we said, the national procurement legislation in Italy awards short food supply chains. So how do you see that? How that the fact that on one hand, there's the EU procurement legislation saying do not discriminate. It's a single big market. You cannot ask for local food. But on the other hand, You have the national Italian procurement legislation saying, on the contrary, we award short food supply chains. Well, uh, first of all, uh, hello to everyone and hello, Peter. I would like to say that it is um, regarding this uh, this issue um, that is it, it is true that the European regulation is uh, is based on um, the non discrimination principle and that the rule prevents the contracting authorities to discriminate between uh, producers uh, or service providers from different European countries or uh, geographical areas. However, we need to take into account that uh, um, in the last two decades, the regulation adopted by uh, both at the European and, and the national level has progressively showed a greater openness uh, to finding a balance between uh, the protection of uh, competition and the protection of other interests, uh, like, the, like the environment, the, the access to the market by small and medium enterprises, uh, uh, or more responsible um, and socially inclusive uh, economic de development. So the will of the, uh, let's say, uh, the will of finding a balance between these conflicting interests apply also for the procurement sector. And if you think about the European directives on uh, public procurement, the ones adopted in 2004 and 2014, they all go towards this direction. In fact, these directives, as you know, expanded the notion of the most advantageous, advantageous offer. And by, do, by doing so, they basically allowed the contracting authority to prior, prioritize within the evaluation of the offers, both the environmental and the uh, social aspects of the tender. And this, the possibility for procurers to give greater value to social and environmental aspects uh, as opposed to the, to the price was, uh, is even more uh, evident uh, within the, the Italian uh, procurement, uh, procurement legislation. It is the procurement law, Italian law itself, uh, which uh, is explicitly recognizes the possibility for procurers to give a greater value uh, to locally sourced food or food from short supply chains. And, and this provision is based on the meat principle. Um, so on the principle of the most economic advantages standard, which is foreseen by, uh, by the, the EU directives or, or procurement. So in my opinion, the compatibility of the Italian legislation within uh, the EU principle um, of non-discrimination is ensured by the fact that the requirement of short supply chain um, uh, is meant to be used as an awarding criterion and not as, an, a, as a requirement to exclude certain suppliers from the competition, as it would be if it was used as a, a selection criteria. Um, so in this way, you are not excluding certain producers or suppliers because they are not based in a certain location, uh, but you are just awarding additional points to those one who commit themselves uh, to, um, uh, to provide food which is partially or completely uh, locally sourced or from, uh, uh, from uh, short supply chains. This was very clear and I'm, I'm really glad that you, you explained it that way in terms of, of balance. It makes a lot of sense. So thanks a lot for clarifying that because this is a question that often comes up especially in Europe when talking about sustainable food procurement. And how do you promote sustainable food procurement and what developments do you see at national 
regional and local level? Well, um, well, I can talk about what we are doing uh, with, within our work in Ecosystemi to, to support a greater uptake of sustainable food procurement in Italy. Uh, in particular, it is worth to mention the, the initiative of, um, on, on food po policy that we, or, um, we organized within the Forum Compra Verde by Green of this year. Uh, for those who have never heard about it, the Forum Compra Verde by Green is uh, an event fully uh, dedicated to green procurement, uh, both private and public, uh, that as an ecosystem we have been organizing for, for 15 years in, in Rome. So within this edition, uh, um, with the edition of this year, we organize a working table dedicated to, uh, to the food policy. And this working table involved both private and public actors uh, of the food sector from Lazio region and was aimed at promoting the inclusion of, of green criteria within the public and private food procurement in the region. Among the private actors uh, that, mm, that were involved, uh, we had big buyers such as Acea, which is uh, one of the most important Italian multi-utility company, uh, and Eni, on one side, and uh, small organic producers uh, like Agricoltura Nuova on the other side. Um, the collaboration between these private and public actors um, started at the forum will, be, will continue uh, within a permanent, uh, let's say a permanent uh, working table uh, coordinated by Arcial which is the regional in-house uh, agency that is, um, is, is in charge of promoting the, the, the development, the innovation of, of the agricultural system in the Lazio region. Uh, and the activities that will be uh, carried out within this working table um, are the analysis of the green criteria that are already being implemented uh, in the tenders, um, um, regarding like the, the food procurement and the identification of and monitoring of the actions to improve the uptake of this criteria at the regional level. And we believe that uh, multi-actor working tables such such this one can be a quite an effective uh, way to promote sustainable procurement. And this applies uh, for all the sector, not, not just for, for food. Yeah, and it's also, it's also worth, worth to say that this experience, this uh, working table is very likely to be uh, replicated uh, at, the, at the national level. You are a strong promoter of green public procurement, but how much do you believe in the, in the power of uh, public procurers and the role of procurers with the, within the food value chain? Can they really drive more sustainable production and supply systems thanks to the public demand? Well, I, I think that public procurement can certainly play a key role in the, the adoption of more sustainable production practices. Uh, we need to take into account that uh, public procurement uh, involves up to 16% of the gross domestic product uh, of the EU, and most of this GDP is related to the food sector. And so we're talking about a huge spending power that can be used by the governments as a, as a lever for the development of more sustainable and, and locally sourced food systems. Let's think at the supply of, of food products um, and the catering services to schools, hospitals, nursing homes, um, uh, prisons, etc. So if this huge amount of demand is oriented um, towards products with a certain social and environmental requirements, uh, the market will see it's very likely that the market will uh, we'd move towards the same direction. Uh, on top of this, we need to take into account that the food system is a complex system, um, mainly due to its connection to a variety of policy fields, like including agriculture, environment, energy, health, uh, education, infrastructure, and so on. And so th these aspects imply, implies that uh, this type of system involves a wide range of, of actors, and all these actors often have conflicting interests that are not easy to mediate. So this is all to say that uh, the food system can be cannot be changed without a systematic approach that would allow to take into account a plurality of interests and objectives, of course, uh, at the same time. So in this sense, food procurement can again play a key role um, because it is a multi-policy and multi-actor tool, which by uh, addressing a plurality of environmental, social, and economic objectives, can uh, at the same time can effectively contribute to a shift of the food system towards 
uh, more sustainable models. And uh, in August last year, the, the revised mandatory food procurement criteria came into force. The difference is that uh, before it was more like a, 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 a series of mass criteria of technical specifications saying this criteria must be met those, you know, I don't know, 50 or 100 percent from organic or or a certain energy class in terms of cooling or heating. But now the role of the public procurers is much more, much stronger in terms of managing the control of, uh, of all these criteria. Could you explain a bit what was the change or why was there this change to giving more power or, or giving a stronger role to the procurer in terms of managing, controlling? We can say that the, the reason why they, uh, they, in the last, uh, the, the last revision of the, the minimum environmental criteria on food procurement, they wanted to, uh, the ministry wanted to highlight and to, to stress the criteria related to the management is, is because they noticed that GPP cannot be effectively implemented in this sector without a training of the employees involved both in the, in the kitchen and in, in serving the meals. They need to be trained on the, in the field of GPP and the field of the sustainability practices related to food. So let's say, for example, how to avoid food waste. So they, they need to be trained on how to um, manage the, the portions of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the food, of the meals, and how to monitor how to monitor the, the waste, and, and the same thing applies for the for the chefs because uh, I mean it is important to train them on how to cook uh, to prepare recipes that that can be appreciated by the consumers, uh, even though they do not they do not include meat, for example, if they if they are not if they are only vegetables based on vegetables and proteins like uh, legumes. It is important to to know to uh, to prepare this this food in a way that it uh, can meet the satisfaction of the consumers again. And I think this is fundamental. It is as you say, you can give the the best food, fresh and all, but then if the cook or the kitchen staff uh, cooks it too long and the nutritional value is lost, it's not so helpful. Or the same way in terms of food waste, if too much is wasted. And or if the procurer is not convinced, so it's it. Uh, I think that is really important also to understand for other public authorities or national governments, inspired by the case of Italy, who that it's not just about putting the criteria and asking for for high high percentages, but it's also about preparing the ground and the, the training. Do you have any examples of Italian municipalities that link their food procurement with? Uh, Climate strategies. Well, uh, we we don't we don't have examples at the moment of uh, particular examples of Italian municipalities linking uh, their food procurement to strategies uh, for climate change mitigation. Uh, however, I can talk about an interesting survey on the links uh, between public procurement and climate strategies that was recently carried out by an Italian uh, consultancy company, which is called uh, Martino and Partners. Um, the results of this survey were presenting during the, um, the conference organized by the GPP Italian Observatory within the Forum Compravedo of this year. This survey involved uh, more than 50 experts on public procurement of many Italian um, contracting authorities and was aimed at uh, analyzing um, the perceived effectiveness of GPP and the Italian uh, minimum environmental criteria in addressing, um, addressing climate change. So they wanted to see if the Italian procurers consider GPP as an effective tool to monitor uh, and tackle climate change. Uh, the results were that the majority of respondents, uh, about 90% of them, so the vast majority, mm -hmm. said that the minimum environmental criteria are not adequate to address climate change. And about 81% uh, said that the Italian code on public works uh, is, is not adequate, ad adequate as well for this purpose. And the, the most interesting thing is that the main reason for these results were identified in the lack of an, an effective, effective indicators uh, and of a, a consolidated monitoring system to measure the impacts of GPP in relation to climate change mitigation objectives. 
And you, Matteo, would you agree with that? Because on one hand, I feel like the, 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 the legislation in Italy is strongly supports, let's say, reduction of food waste. And we know that's one, one way to reduce also greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, to a certain extent, it's also by increasing organic food. But then uh, an important aspect is also the increase in, in, in plant-rich food. Are the responses because procurers are not aware of how they could reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Or is it because they are not so open to increasing the plant-rich food, which eventually is the Mediterranean diet, especially in Italy, is a lot about plant-rich food. It's not about uh, so much about meat. So what is your... Uh, thinking there or how do you see that? I think that it's not because the, the GPP is not uh, effective in this way, but it's because it's still um, the public authorities uh, don't know how to monitor the effects, the impacts that what came out from the, from the survey. The procurers are not trained uh, on how to, um, to monitor, to measure these impacts. Another interesting result that came out from the service that the indicator that was considered to be the most effective one in measuring the impacts of GPP uh, for climate change mitigation objectives was the LCC methodology. So, so it is important to train the procurers on how to uh, adopt LCC methodology within their tenders because there is not a wide uh, use of this tool. Could you just... Explain it in a few lines so that everyone understands what you mean when you say LCC. The LCC is a methodology that um, uh, is aimed at including in the purchasing process the cost, the envir both environmental and indirect costs related to the, the goods or services that, that you are purchasing. So you are not just uh, uh, taking into account uh, the price of that good or service, but you are also considering Uh, the, the cost for the, for the maintenance, the cost related to, the, to energy use, for example, to run the IT equipment, the, the cost related to the disposal, at the, the disposal of this, uh, of this good at the end of the, their life. So in the case of the procurers, when you need to decide which tender uh, is the, the, the most advant advantageous tender, you need to take into account The, the, all the costs throughout the life cycle of the goods and not just the price. I think that this is, uh, so this is a very important step to do towards uh, the implementation uh, uh, of GPP is uh, train uh, procurers on how to uh, use LTC methodology within the, their tenders because it's not easy and uh, we need to spread also uh, to promote the use of this tool of, of the tools because there are many tools and, and you as ecosystemi do you promote or do you have any tools uh, for procurers that can uh, in order to measure the the greenhouse gas emissions reductions through food procurement? we do have uh, uh, tools that we have developed uh, within ecosystemi and um, especially related to, to some category of products and services. Uh, food catering is one of, of those, but we also develop uh, a LCC tool for, for maintenance of the, the parks and uh, for transport as well. But I mean, there are also, uh, there are also LCC tools developed at the um, European level. Within our training, we also uh, refer uh, to those tools Uh, so we, so th they are very well explained. The the, the, the procurers uh, can uh, can can use uh, uh, Excel files and, and guide a very very uh, very very effective guide on how to use the uh, the tools. Thank you very much. You also mentioned uh, education. Could you give some examples? So how is education tackled or what would that mean education in, in public procurement how is that linked or what would uh, public procurers ask in terms of food or nutrition education so yeah education plays a very very relevant role in, uh, in public procurement uh, for food also because uh, the idea of, of public or green public procurement itself is uh, educational Uh, in the sense that um, by introducing and, uh, and letting um, uh, users 
get in touch with different ways of consuming products and services, you are already educating the, the population. Obviously, this impact is multiplied when you have to do with food in schools because that engages um, human beings when they are in, a, in an early stage of their life, then they, when they are really uh, open also to, um, you know, to, to, to intercept new ideas and, uh, and, they, and it's easier for them also to change their lifestyles. And also students mm -hmm. have a large impact on families. Uh, because when children come back from school and they can bring back into their home new habits, that has got uh, a much more intimate and, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, impactful effect on, on families. And are you also aware of uh, public procurers that in their tenders ask for awareness raising uh, on uh, food education and nutrition from uh, suppliers and caterers or that I know in some other countries they also ask for to, to organize a trip you know to the production side so that the children understand that where the food comes from and the cow is not the blue and these things. Yeah. Unfortunately it's still largely disattended in the sense that it's not uh, so common but when it happens it's got uh, a very very powerful impact on, on children. First of all because it's an occasion to bring together you know, um, students, their families, and teachers. So you can have a more coordinated action, and um, and uh, and therefore the message you pass is more consistent. Um, but also because when the catering companies, the 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 food providers get in direct contact with students and families and let them understand what's actually happening in the kitchen, what what's actually what's actually happening in the in the production sites that can can really bring a change so yeah I'm, it should be done more it should definitely be done much more also about the agriculture we talked about local and regional food but we know that agriculture plays an important role and there is no food without the farmers and beside that it's very exciting to see the power of, uh, of, of, of procurement, in particular food procurement and how it connects to so many aspects. But coming back to agriculture, I mean, like in many other places in Europe and in the world, many Italian cities do no longer have uh, farmers or big production sites around their cities. So overall, how can public authorities ensure, uh, also think about the short supply chains and so on, in the in our in the realities that we have today, that uh, this high percentage of sustainable or organic uh, food is being supplied, and how can they really uh, support uh, smaller farmers in this context and comply with the with the mandatory criteria? What you said is right. The Italian agriculture is um, partially in decline. Uh, it's carried out uh, in small um farm holds and uh, and often is not able to um intercept the public demand properly and and also to provide with uh, with sufficient offer especially when it comes down to uh um organic food so what happens today is that a lot of the organic request is not bought locally which is like the first the first annotation we can make. How can we change this? How can we bring the production of wealth closer to the community that is actually consuming food? The first thing is that you you can change menus. You can change menus in order to intercept better local production. So you can work with nutritionists, still respect the the national um, nutrition uh, targets. Uh, but make it more fitting with the with the local production. And the second thing you can do is, and you have to do it, is to talk with your producers to prepare the field for it. Prepare the fields literally. <laughs> so um, you have to have um, pre-commercial agreements. You have to have a pre-market dialogue. You have to, to train, to engage, and, and also to realize that 
public procurement is just one part of that large food system we were talking about earlier on. So um, when, when you plan, and this is like a large problem for many sectors of public administrations, when you plan intervention in one sector, which in this case is supplying food for canteens and hospitals and whatever, uh, you cannot do it without a coordinated actions with other sectors like the agricultural production and the, the governance of the economic aspects. The third thing is having a more integrated planning um, for the development of the local of the local economy. So that means also rebuilding, for example, value chains that are interrupted, because this is another problem. You, you might have the production, but you might not be able to bring that production into the public plate. So you need an integrated local planning. Talking about COVID, uh, has that have, has COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic had any impact on promoting sustainable food procurement, applying uh, all these criteria, this mandatory criteria on, on sustainable food procurement? I remember there was even, I heard about a petition against the plastification, let's say, of meals in Italy. But uh, have there been any other uh, impacts that you would say? Well, of course, the the plastification it, it has been a you know a bad impact of COVID. I hope that this is going to change. Uh, of course, the good impact of COVID has been that we can do uh, we can do uh, training to many many different people because the digitalization has you know got a, a very huge step up. Well, yeah, in Italy, uh, many environmental aspects and social aspects just got kind of suspended by the pandemic so uh, actually uh, the, the expected positive impact that we were all looking for on strengthening local supply chains and uh, you know skipping the long long value chains kind of didn't happen but what, what we saw is that actually on, on private uh, food consumption Uh, it, it did have a positive impact because many families started buying more locally, basically. Professor Marino, which is one of the coordinators of the Rome Food Policy, coordinated a, a study uh, exactly on this topic. And I, what, what we noticed is that, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly, family consumption did change. So many, many families got in contact with local producers and some new supply chains and also new services started to rise. Linked to this uh, societal dimension, if one can say so, I almost forgot to ask uh, more specifically, what social impact do you see of sustainable public procurement? Well, for sure, the, um, the first impact, which is very relevant, is on the concept of One Health, so, which is, you know, It's been recently promoted by the WHO organization. And uh, the idea that is bringing forward is that human health is strictly connected with environmental health and also with animal welfare. So um, we, we, we can say that, and health, we, we can all agree, is the basis of well-being. And um, so that, that, that's probably it's the first very important impact that for sure uh, sustainable public procurement and food has got. But also you, you can, we can see, we, we talked a lot about uh, short supply chains. So we, talk, we talked about the creation of local employment opportunities, which is one, uh, one aspect. But also another really relevant aspect, which is fighting food poverty. We know that uh, the share of families that cannot provide adequate meals at home is is unfortunately increasing and it's uh, worsening. I mean, the, the, the economic crisis that followed the pandemics has, has um, drastically increased this problem. Uh, so serving good quality food in, in schools and uh, in hospitals and other public places is for sure a, a very relevant uh, social impact. But then if you look at the social criteria contained in the CAM and the Italian legislation, as Alberta was saying, there are some other very really relevant aspects. 
One is the fight against caporalato, which is a form of indirect engagement of agricultural workers uh, that brings along uh, massive problems linked to organized criminality and the um, abuses of, of human rights for the, on those workers. So the Italian legislation focuses on, on, on this aspect and is trying to, to reduce this risk. And this will have a large impact. The other aspect is to uh, make the land that has been um, taken away from mafia families, uh, to make it productive for uh, sustainable agriculture. And sustaining those uh, type of production is very important because you can imagine it. You know, you, you start your farm, your, your beautiful agricultural farm on the, um, on, on, on the land that has been taken from a, um, a mafia family. If you are not supported by not only the local community, but also like a proper market that can provide you with uh, also financial means, you, you are um, bound to fail because the, you know, the affiliates of the family will burn your... Uh, production will uh, threaten your life and so on and so on. So this is another really important social impact. And the other aspect we, you touched, but which still holds uh, a great potential, is linked with social agriculture. When we talk about social agriculture, we are talking about the inclusion of people with different uh, vulnerabilities, vulnerable, vulnerable groups um, that can benefit from um, being basically employed in agricultural activities. Usually they are cooperatives, but anyway, for this type of social enterprises, it might be difficult to keep up with, you know, the, the production standards that uh, often the market requires. Uh, not always, but it can be challenging. So having a specific um, criterion that gives a bonus to the um, enterprises that besides providing, you know, goods with all the environmental standards that are mandatory, can also employ the vulnerable groups, it's actually very relevant. It's got uh, a potential impact. There's a problem at the moment with the way it's that, that criterion, criterion has been structured because of the way that the public administration can verify that the production is really organic. They, they buy vertically volumes. So if I need, I don't know how many tons of um, tomatoes and I have to meet the, the percentage of organic food, I will buy that slot from one big producer of organic tomatoes. So companies coming working in the field of social agriculture often cannot meet the quantities required. So it's still difficult for them to get in. But I, I believe it will improve. I mean, it's a really new, new criterion that has been introduced. It was introduced just uh, in 2020. It's very impressive what's going on in Italy in terms of uh, sustainable food procurement, uh, very inspiring. Uh, I have a, a last question, which is about uh, your work as Ecosystem. You mentioned you organize every year this national forum Compra Verde, which is about green public procurement, which uh, brings together procurers from all over Italy, but also from Europe, discussing good practices, discussing uh, difficulties, barriers around sustainable procurement, also food procurement. And at that annual event, you also award the Mensa Verde Award, the Green Cantina Award. Are there any other highlights or good practices that you would single out or that you would like to mention? Yes. Um, yeah, so Fano is for sure the, the first uh, to be mentioned uh, and uh, Milan, uh, but there are also other examples. So Fano, by the way, it was a, a, a very, um, it was a pioneer because they included the, the criteria in their tender before 
uh, they were published so that they, they didn't need to to include the criteria at the time and they did and they had an offer which was even uh, was was exceeding the criteria they were offering more than uh, they were offering 100 percent of organic food most of the food and fair trade and uh, conf- um, and uh, as sabina was saying uh, food uh, coming from uh, land uh, confiscated to the mafia etc so this has been a very virtuous thing and uh, it's not a surprise that uh, it he got first prize in the Food Insider poll among all the school uh, canteens in Italy. But uh, there are other examples. Uh, so uh, for sure, uh, Spoleto has is, is been the first uh, tender which has been uh, um, which has uh, taken the criteria after they've been published, and um, they had a project of uh, education in the school uh, to sustainability of food in in the tender, and again higher percentages of organic food already in the tender and they had uh, all the management of the waste management that we were talking about so there they were you know another very virtuous example then there is oh turin as well uh, turin uh, municipalities uh, again they have uh, they've applied the they've applied the criteria to the social canteens and uh, they have conventions for example with on with the um, Unless for uh, um, giving the food uh, to animals, the food which has been served and not used, so as a food for animals, and they also have a, a convention with other type of association uh, to give the non the unserved food uh, to people. Uh, so this is uh, another mm, very good example. And then uh, there are also examples which are not uh, public, uh, public procurers. For example, Acea, which is a um, water company, one, one of the main water company and also electricity company in Italy. Uh, they have introduced some criteria for food waste uh, saving. For example, they give the unserved food to Onlus and they have this big project of compost uh, in many different locations where the food goes goes directly locally from the canteen to uh, the compost and can be used as a compost uh, in uh, agriculture. So I'd say, um, you know, even though the criteria have been uh, um, published quite recently, we have, um, you know, we have a very good and positive start uh, that, that we can see already. What shall I say? What a journey. We heard so much about the sustainable food procurement, all the possibilities, benefits, the power of uh, the public plate, and also Im- impressive how Italy has not only a big food culture, but also a big sustainable food procurement legislation with mandatory criteria, which shows the support from the national level, from the from the top uh, on uh, rolling out and having impact along the food value chain of sustainable food procurement, but seeing also the impact on the social, on the environmental, and on the economic side. So, grazie mille for sharing your insight about this rich uh, reality on food procurement in Italy. I don't want to have the last word, so on to you, Alberta, Sabina. Are there any final pearls, words of wisdom that you would like to share on on this experience with us? Uh, I believe engagement is the key for a successful transition in food systems. So, if you want to achieve uh functional and uh, truly innovative sustainable food procurement we have to make sure that everyone's got a role is properly engaged so we have to engage producers we have to engage consumers we have also to engage public administrations transversally um just to give you a, a very much used but i think very powerful um uh, sentence just to close it up is that if you're not part of the solution you're definitely part of the problem so we have to help everyone who can be part of the solution to be an active part of the solution thank you and arrivederci goodbye bye bye ciao 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 Che bello, what an interesting interview. It really showed an example of sustainable food procurement and short food supply chains being led by national legislation that incorporates the country's rich food culture. Grazie mille Sabina, Alberta and Matteo for joining the Power of the Public Plate podcast for their great work in Italy. 
To learn more about their program, check out the episode description. And if you like this podcast, you can support us by sharing it with your colleagues and friends. We invite you to check out the other episodes and to connect us on Twitter or websites at the UN One Planet Network, as well as ECLA Local Governments for Sustainability. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned for the next episode. Arrivederci. Goodbye.